Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is February 12th, 2010, and my guest is Edmund Phelps, the McVicker Professor of Political Economy at Columbia University, director of Columbia's Center on Capitalism and Society, and the winner of the 2006 Nobel Prize in Economics. Professor Phelps, welcome to Econ Talk. Thank you. I want to start with a quote from your Nobel Prize lecture. It's a little long, but it's, I think, very important. And it's the quote begins by talking about uh, Paul Samuelson's work, and Samuelson recently passed away. And for listeners who don't know, his Samuelson's 1948 uh, work, The Foundations of Economic Analysis, really was the uh, beginning of certainly a landmark in the formalization of economic theory into mathematical form. Not that there hadn't been mathematics before, but Samuelson really uh, took it to a, a much higher level. And here's what the, uh, the quote is from uh, Professor Phelps's Nobel Prize lecture. Samuelson's project to correct, clarify, and broaden the theory brought into focus its strengths, but also its limitations. It abstracted from the distinctive character of the modern economy, the endemic uncertainty, ambiguity, diversity of beliefs, specialization of knowledge, and problem solving. As a result, it could not capture or endogenize the observable phenomena that are endemic to the modern economy, innovation, waves of rapid growth, big swings in business activity, disequilibria, intense employee engagement, and workers' intellectual development. The best and brightest of the neoclassicals saw these defects but lacked a micro-theory to address them. So, end of quote. So, Mike, to get us started, I'd like you to talk about how your work on unemployment, which you've spent a a great deal of, of time and effort on, how your work on unemployment began to address these, begins to address these problems. Um, I'm not sure that it did really address those problems head on in in day one. Um, it, it's I, when, when I started trying to um, create abstract models cast in terms of equations. Uh, when I tried to, to do that. I had to make a zillion choices about what I was going to assume and what I would not assume. Mm-hmm. And sure. um, um, at this point, it, I, it, it was very natural for me to uh, reject the idea of um, a perfect foresight about the future. Mm-hmm. I just didn't want to to, to, not that I hadn't done some work in that vein, I had, but, but when I started work on unemployment in 1966, uh, I, I didn't want to go that way. I wanted to get more real, more realistic. And so I, I, I didn't, uh, so I just, uh, it, it's not that I had some breakthrough way of, of capturing people's uncertainty or how they thought about the future uh, not at all, but um, <clears throat> I simply wasn't willing to uh, impute to people um, a, a knowledge of of, of, of uh, the consequences of their present decisions uh, for the future. <clears throat> and and I and I, I became increasingly conscious as I I worked on unemployment over a period of a decade from 66 to 1970, I, I became increasingly conscious that uh, um, this was important and, and um, well, it, it, I, w- I wouldn't even, I w- wouldn't, wouldn't be able to, uh, would hardly be able to talk about the, the, at least the, the, the major sources of, um, of business fluctuations if I were to put on the straight jacket of uh, perfect foresight. So do you think that the rational expectations approach was a, a dead end, a wrong way, to, wrong way to go? 
Well, in 1966, the term rational expectations didn't exist. And, and, and we didn't have much in the way of mathematical models that look like statistics with probabilities and stuff like that. We, we, we had some models like that. But, um, so I didn't really think of myself as being some extraordinary deviant hmm. for, from uh, rational expectations. I knew that there were people like, oh, uh, the Frenchman uh, Valras and uh, Newt Vixell and, and the, the Swede and uh, um, another later Swedish economist whose name uh, momentarily escapes me. Hmm. I, I knew that, and, and, and to some extent Irving Fisher, the... Uh, the great uh, theorist about interest rates and so forth, so forth at Yale. I knew that there there were important figures out there <clears throat> who had invoked uh, knowledge uh, of the future, did Im- impute knowledge of the future to, to, to the actors in their models. But but there were also people like um, Frank Knight, uh, the great the dominant economic theorist at the University of Chicago in the 1920s and uh, 1930s, uh, who, who thought that the future is essentially uncertain, and every businessman knows that, worries about it all the time. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and, of course, Friedrich Hayek um, emphasized time and time again that uh, uh, if... Uh, somebody uh, brings out something new to the market, um, that person has no idea whether it's going to succeed or fail. If it's new, how could anybody know? And then and John Maynard Keynes also uh, emphasized that um, whether an entrepreneur is going to decide to go ahead with, a, with an innovative project or not, or even an, an uninnovative project, is going to depend upon uh, his or her uh, animal spirits, and uh, so um, I was faced with a choice. I could go either way. I could go with these more classical people, that former group, or I could go with the modernists, uh, the, this this latter group. And it just temperamentally, I was much more attuned to the to the modernists, so I, I, I went that way. And of course, there was a lot of other work going on at the yeah, same so, time. Let me just add. So then. Then, then the this rational expectations rage uh, came really toward the end of my work uh, in the second half of the 1960s. Um, <clears throat> John Muth uh, was the first to talk about it, or almost the first to talk about it explicitly. So his idea was was that well, people don't know exactly the future, but they know the the probability distribution that that governs the future. So, in other words, they don't know which ball is going to be pulled out of the urn, but they know what's in that urn. <clears throat> and and uh, so, in the 1970s, m- my work, the, uh, some of my work survived and was drawn upon, but my whole, but but. But 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 my models were regarded as um, flawed for not having uh, uh, introduced rational expectations. Something and, and, something close to perfect foresight. Yeah, which is it was very close to perfect foresight. Right. So in the 1960s, the sort of the irony of this conversation is that in the 1960s, when you were starting this work. Unemployment was was very low, uh, but by the end of the seventies, it was very high, and yep. there was a belief that that our models, certainly our equilibrium models based on of the labor market, were not performing in a very satisfactory way. Mm-hmm. So, so talk about what your insights and your models. What was different about them, and how did how do you look at at the labor market um, 
and, and the problem of unemployment? Well, as economics became more and more mathematicized, um, um, it became more and more standard to uh, think of each market as having a price that cleared the market. So there was no excess demand and no excess supply. And um, one way in which I, I, I differed from that was uh, I argued that uh, companies have an incentive to set their wages above the market clearing level for their own self-interests. <clears throat> I didn't uh, rationalize this very well, maybe right away, but eventually I saw what, what was going on here. So that equilibrium in a sense of um, no one being surprised by what the others are doing. Equilibrium in that sense is characterized by uh, the involuntary unemployment that comes from companies having uh, a self-interest in keeping their wages up. And, and uh, that, that self-interest is always about that the companies are trying to keep their quit rates down and trying to give incentives for people not to, to shirk or snitch something from the shelf. And, uh, so and they wanted to the, keep... The companies want to give the employee something to lose in the event that, that the employee is not performing well and caught not performing well. And presumably there's a cost to turnover that the firms want to economize on. Yes, yes, yes. I was, I was emphasizing it. Funnily enough, that, that hardly uh, ever uh, was um, emphasized in the succeeding literature, even though empirically it's probably more important than, than all the other things put together. So in a sense, I brought unemployment back into the picture. That was uh, one thing. The other thing is, uh, in, in, in my work in the 60s, I emphasize that, look, you're, you're, you're the, if people get fooled, if, 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 if firms don't realize that the other firms are paying, as, have, have increased their wages the same, as much as it has, as each one has, if each, each firm doesn't realize that the others are raising their wages too, then they can, they can all get fooled. And employment will will the wages will be less high than they would have been if the if if the wage setters knew what was going on, and employment is going to be lower than it otherwise would have been. So, so I was emphasizing that look, stop talking about equilibrium so obsessively. We can also be out of equilibrium, and and, and if we're out of equilibrium, then um, sooner or later, uh, information is going to come come out that shows that people are. are I've got it wrong, and then they're going to react to that. And so wages are going to pick up. They're going to start rising faster. And prices are going to, uh, with, and pushed up by wages, prices are going to rise faster. And then you'll, you'll, you'll start to get um, very clear inflation. Well, I wasn't trying to predict the 1970s when I wrote that. I wasn't. But, it, but I, I did realize that the unemployment rate was extremely low in the... Um, uh, in the last half of the 1960s, and, and uh, so I, I had to, to explain to myself why how this could be, and my answer was that people are, don't know what's going on. They, they're not paying much attention to what their competitors are doing, and uh, they're just uh, out of out of uh, out of equilibrium. But the, but the inflation will turn up. Just you wait. And uh, sure enough, it it. The 1970s was a very inflationary period. Of course, it's more complicated than what I just said. But no, but that's a, what's interesting about it uh, is the, is the I like the way that you think about uncertainty, not just in the future, which is the standard way we think about it, but in the present. That I don't just not know what's going to happen down the road. I'm not sure what's happening right now. Yeah, and as you point out in your Nobel Prize lecture, uh, when you're in a a medieval economy, you know all the people you trade with, you see all their transactions. Mm -hmm. In a modern economy, knowledge is very costly and difficult to acquire. So it's yeah. spread out. It's a very yeah. Hayekian point. It's it can't be it's dispersed among geographically and, mm -hmm. and physically. 
among the the minds mm-hmm. of the of the people, mm-hmm. and uh, you're a little, everybody's in the dark a little bit all the time. Yeah, that's very good. Yes, and I like the medieval thing because um, if everybody's working in the manor, they're, they're just uh, they're uh, self sufficient. They're producing for themselves, and um, of course, once you get uh, globalization, so to speak, uh, or just uh, a national market. With specialization, then then, uh, then then people have a very hard time understanding exactly what's going on. So, how does that? How did you, those insights uh, interact with the Keynesian idea of aggregate demand? And then, in particular, the situ- in particular the situation we're in now. Well, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, I didn't start out to be uh, to try to uh, unseat Keynes. I was trying to uh, provide a microeconomic foundation for the basic ideas of Keynesian economics. I was trying to show why if aggregate demand increased, the effect would not be simply uh, a momentary increase of output and employment until uh, until uh, people caught on, uh, but rather... The, 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 there could be um, a, a prolonged period uh, uh, in which output and employment were elevated relative to the equilibrium path I was talking about. And, and uh, so um, I, I wasn't being un-Keynesian or anti-Keynesian in that respect. Quite the contrary, I was... Uh, uh, taking Keynes fully on board and trying to make uh, make sense of him, but uh, there was one little thing, and that is that um, it seemed to me a natural consequence of, of my argument that uh, if if uh, the monetary authorities, for example, tried to maintain output and employment at uh, its elevated level by pouring more and more money uh, into the economy when money wages and money prices are pushed up, uh, then eventually people will begin to anticipate uh, price increases and wage increases in the rest of the economy and in the future. And so um, that won't work. That, 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 that attempt <clears throat> to, to kind of legislate a disequilibrium, that attempt on the part of the central bank won't work. Well, this was uh, very upsetting to the, the Keynesians, and um, and it was very. I, I, I probably wasn't quite as hated <laughs> as Milton Friedman, but in, in a way, I might have been hated more because um, Milton Friedman was never in the Keynesian camp, while right. <laughs> I was thought to be uh, uh, basically a Keynesian, but. Uh, but he the was Keynesians didn't forgive me for uh, for this one little um, deviation from what they thought. And Friedman was doing something similar with his attack on the Phillips curve and the attempts of central banks to continually fight mm-hmm. unemployment with monetary policy. Yeah, yes, that's that's right. Friedman was doing something similar. Uh, I thought his model wasn't uh, very attractive, wasn't very persuasive, and so I thought. Uh, I thought um, my model was better. Um, also, I thought that he oversimplified in lots of ways that I didn't like. Uh, his strength and his weakness was that he oversimplified a lot. Yeah, well, it's a strength and a weakness. There's, yeah. no, there's no doubt about it. <laughs> let, let me ask a naive question um, as a micro guy. Uh, in, in a certain way, you know, I think there's a – there's a, a strange schizophrenia between micro and macro that you know we like to say micro you know market's clear and there's more quote equilibrium but in in macro we've got this disequilibrium in the labor market but it seems to me that we have the same disequilibrium in both the micro and the macro sides and I don't think of it as disequilibrium per se and I I think it's often useful to think of it as an equilibrium phenomenon but but it has the same challenge which is and I ask this of my students all the time. If you go into a grocery store, there's lots of stuff on the shelves when it closes, and there's cars sitting in the lot at the at the uh, car 
at the auto dealer. We don't say those markets are in disequilibrium because there's all this unsold stock. We no. don't. We don't say. No. Well, why didn't they just lower their price and sell everything? <clears throat> no, because, and, no. And fundamentally, the answer is is that inventories are there because future demand is uncertain. Disappointing a customer is really to be avoided. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we don't expect those markets to clear in the textbook way. We, mm -hmm. we understand there's a richer story to tell. Mm -hmm. Isn't that what's going on in the labor market, that it's costly? No, I, I don't really think so. Okay. Um, tell me why. Um, oh, I, I, by the way, I want to make it clear that, that a car that doesn't get sold yeah. doesn't have a family to feed. So it's, there is a different... Yeah, yeah, no, no, social no, no, aspect yeah. to it. <laughs> no, no, okay, the, the, no, 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 I'm not, uh, not ready to uh, put you in jail for what you said. <laughs> um, um, the the story you told is essentially a story about a kind of stochastic equilibrium. There are ups and downs in the volume of business from day to day, and some some days you end up with a, a smaller number of cars left in the lot than uh, than you would have guessed. <clears throat> but um, it's perfectly possible that to to build mathematical models in which there uh, are probability distributions that govern whether somebody gets up in the morning and goes t to a lot to buy a used car or not, and, and uh, so you, you can you can you can build a, a model in which a precautionary stock of cars is kept in in used car lots. If you don't have the one there, you can't sell one, and, and um, so. There is a sense in which um, um, there's a sense in which um, sure everyone would like to have sold more cars, but uh, and and sure nobody can predict the number of cars that are actually sold. But it, isn't that the true? story you're telling is essentially uh, one of um, of. Uh, y You're talking uh, that story, at least in its usual version. I don't know about your your, your precise views, but, but people who talk that way usually slip very quickly into the thought that well, everybody knows these probability distributions, and we're just looking at a stochastic process. So now, if you carry that over to the labor market, then then it, it's it's saying, look, people lose their jobs, uh, so they they then go and look for. Another one. There's some frictions, and, and um, but you're always in a, in a kind of stochastic equilibrium. Well, I, I don't. I, I can see the grain of truth in that story. It's just not the story I'm interested in. As a macroeconomist, I'm interested in a story in which something happens to cause the whole industry to be off. To be to have to to get it wrong. Well, let, let me tell. That, for example, I mean, uh, there could be uh, some sort of obscure monetary development that causes people to want to reduce their bank holdings and, and uh, load up more on things for the refrigerator and and, and so forth and so on. So, uh, I mean, things like like that. There there are macro shocks. That are that are not quickly identified, that that catch people having r wrong expectations in the sense of not having probability distributions in their mind that are that are the right ones. No, I totally agree. L l let me re ask the let me ask the question a different way. In in the current world, right now, where unemployment is about ten percent. We have some people who've been unemployed for a very long time, some people for a short time. Many of them are receiving unemployment compensation, which is pleasant but not not great. Uh, it beats the alter it beats having nothing, but it it's not as good as having a job psychologically or financially. So 
It strikes me that when you're unemployed, th- there are lots of jobs available, but what you don't know, just like the employer who doesn't the, – the producer who doesn't know what the price mm-hmm. uh, and, and wages being offered by competitors are, if you're out of work and you're offered a job that pays less than the job you had before, you don't know whether that's your best alternative mm-hmm. or whether that's just mm-hmm. a bad draw out of the urn, as you said. Mm-hmm. And so there, there's an optimal – and that's the wrong word – you, you wait. You're not sure what to do because there's a cost to quitting and and that new job if it turns out you were wrong. Sure. Sure. So it seems to me that process is a massive part of why why there's unemployment, measured unemployment at all, but in particular why during a downturn uh, unemployment persists and that so-called dis- – I mean I don't consider that – I guess we can call it a disequilibrium, but it seems like a perfectly – Rational response to imperfect information. Uh, I'm not saying anybody's being ir- I, I, in my models. I don't think of anybody as being uh, irrational. They're all doing the best they can, and 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 I agree that um, if um, I agree that if the bottom drops out of the housing market, and a lot of construction workers find themselves um, unemployed, just to keep the story short, then. Um, then even if um, uh, even if um, there will be some sort of um, adjustment of prices and wages that will bring the economy back to the same aggregate level of ac- economic activity, it's going to take a while for uh, round pegs to find round holes and square pegs to find square holes. And, and, uh, yeah, that's um, absolutely uh, fine. Um, But um, I... I think what I think what 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 comes out of what we're just talking about is that there is a non-Keynesian story about employment and unemployment and adjustments and persistence and so forth that wasn't addressed by my work in the 1960s. That's absolutely right. I was just addressing myself to what was the prevailing view about employment and unemployment and trying as best I could, to make sense of it. Now, what you're saying is that there are also more structuralist views which say, for example, that, look, when there's a, there's a shock, it's not, you know, across the board exactly the same for every company. Some industries are different from others, and that some industries have different experience than others, and maybe the, maybe the downturn is, is concentrated in, say, construction activity. I agree completely. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, in the past 20 years, I spent all my time on that. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I wasn't making the observation as a, as a criticism, just as, to me, I was Chicago trained, yeah. and and I was a student of Robert Lucas yeah. in, in the classroom. Not I did my dissertation in micro, but yeah. um, you know, Robert Lucas is a very smart man and, yes. and a very deep and, and thoughtful Theorist, and I, yes. I learned a great deal from him. Yes, but in the recent years, I've become more interested in the Austrian approach. Yeah. and it seems that the you know in the Austrian world of where imperfect information is so important, and where this these structural changes are very important, you can't just look at aggregates. It, it strikes me that in the current downturn, twenty two percent, a little more, twenty two point six percent of the jobs that have been lost since the beginning of the recession are in construction. So it's a big sector. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm just making the observation that it's that it seems to me that if you're a construction worker, very hard to figure out whether your job's coming back tomorrow, in six months, in two years, or never. Absolutely. And, and no, the smartest person in the world doesn't yeah. know the answer to that question, let alone the average construction worker who might know more about construction but doesn't know a lot about market dynamics, inevitably. So it seems to me that 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 nighty and uncertainty, which I think is yeah. inherent in your right. sort of your methodological that's right. approach, that's right. is, is yeah. 
got to be an important yeah. part so of the story. So it was easy then for me to to uh, start thinking uh, along more Austrian lines at the end of the 1980s. At the, at the end of the 1980s, uh, I noticed that the world didn't look very Keynesian to me anymore. There had been a tremendous uh, depression in Europe with unemployment rates of like 15%. Uh, in the middle of the 1980s, and and um, and they just hung that way. They they hung up there, and there was no deflation or disinflation. And so I thought, wait a minute, there, there's, we we need to find a structuralist sto- story to understand this kind of thing. And and uh, so I worked on that between the late. 1980s, 1988 or so, 87, actually 86 to be more accurate, right through until about uh, 2000, uh, well, up to up to around up to around the year 2000. But that's... and and and, and um... can you back uh, up for a sec and yeah, talk about yeah, uh... talk about why that was the Keynesian? Why did that? Why did that? A lack of an inverse relationship between unemployment and prices. Mm-hmm. Why was that a challenge to the Keynesian model? What was the well, Keynesian the, the, story? The Keynes had, had left the whole behavior of money wage rates as something of a puzzle. Not that he didn't give it some thought, but he didn't really give much in the way of clues as to what his thinking was. And then Phillips came along with the Phillips curve which said not that when employment is high, workers ask for a high level of the wage. Rather, when employment is high, or unemployment, unemployment is low, uh, we see money wage rates rising faster than if uh, employment is uh, lower. So the, the higher the level of employment the faster money wage rates are rising. And the the Keynesians embrace this as the solution to their problem of what on earth to do about wages in their models. So really, we, we beginning uh, with uh, Phillips' paper in uh, 1957 uh, uh, or so, uh, there grew up a kind of Keynes Phillips model, and, and uh, so and 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 and, and uh, so that model implied or made the forecast that uh, in Europe, with uh, unemployment rates rising to fifteen percent or so, uh, you would have. Uh, Money wage rates rising a lot more slowly than they were before, or in fact, money wage rates would probably be falling, have to be falling with unemployment rates that way. And they weren't. And prices weren't falling either. So, so I realized that just have to throw this was a this was a this was a kind of downturn that the Keynesian model had nothing to say about. So 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 then I started working on on um, trying to. I started working on uh, modeling of um, of the determination of the natural unemployment rate itself, and um, with an eye to trying to understand, trying to explain the uh, the uh, the European phenomenon in the 1980s. And what did you come up with? What I came up with with was that things like wealth, real interest rates, and real exchange rates, variables that you would have had in a non-monetary model, without any money at all, those variables are very, those, they impact on the natural unemployment rate itself. Are you there? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And um, uh, 
I, maybe I can give a, a, a clue as to, to how, how uh, my reasoning went. If, um, if I uh, recall something that Milton Friedman used to say. Friedman was himself more of a Keynesian than he ever wanted to admit. He was a sort of a half Keynesian. And, and, and he said something like this. He said, look, <clears throat> if you have a decrease in demand, doesn't doesn't matter what it is. It could be a decrease of investment demand, decrease of export demand, whatever, <clears throat> in an open economy, then... <clears throat> You know, you could look to money wage rates to solve the problem, or it might be more convenient, or at least as convenient, to look to, to the exchange rate to solve the problem. You, you could, w- 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 when the investment demand weakens or export demand weakens, uh, that would uh, lower interest rates. That would cause the currency to drop. The currency should. Where where will the currency uh, where will where will it hit bottom? Where how far will it fall? It'll keep on falling until demand is back up to where it was before. Employment is back up to where where it is before, and why is that? Because that's what has to happen for the interest rate to be back up to where it's where it was before. Because the interest rate in this country is going to have to be the same as the interest rate in the rest of the world. In other words, the exchange rate keeps on keeps on falling until the economy has healed itself fully. At that point, the interest rate in the country is back up to where it was before, which is at the level in the rest of the world. Because otherwise, that mo- that market's going to be in disequilibrium. Yeah. Capital's yes. going right. to flow across okay. borders. Okay. okay, so there was being there was Friedman using impeccable Keynesian kind of reasoning, but reaching but reaching a kind of non-Keynesian answer. He was yeah. saying, yes, there's unemployment for a while. Yes, I'll put employment down initially in response to the decrease of demand. But the, the wage price mechanism will operate to bring the economy back to the same old equilibrium. Well, you see, he was implicitly supposing what so many Keynesians were always supposed, namely that the structure of demands don't matter, that doesn't matter. Just aggregates, yeah. And and um, in the models that I built in the late '80s and the early 1990s, uh, at least the one or one or two of them that had an exchange rate in them, in, in some important way, uh, that's not that's not um, that's not uh, true. That's not the case when the exchange rate falls, um, <clears throat> that, um, that, uh, that's like an increase of uh, tariffs. Domestic firms are now better protected against uh, foreign competition. So um, they will respond by raising markups. And uh, so the prices will rise relative to wages, which is like lowering price, lowering wages relative to prices. And you move down something like a labor supply curve. And the new equilibrium is not, where, is not one where employment is back to where it was before. The new equilibrium is one where employment is, is lower than it was before, lower than it was initially, because, uh, because uh, real exchange rate depreciation has this little negative in it that, that is always overlooked by the people who see real exchange rate depreciation as a salvation. So uh, later on, by the way, there are two sector stories that, that uh, are, are, are sort of the same thing, that, that, um, that uh, when you have a real exchange rate depreciation, that's tantamount to a decrease in the relative price of non-tradables. Um, and um, and um, so you see again, you're, 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 the structure is not neutral. Well, let me let me make a an observation about that, which you can react to if you want. But then I want to shift gears into a, a different area. It, it a lot of this conversation 
reminds me of how difficult macro is um, because you know, we start you start off this the story by saying <clears throat> suppose demand decreases and not for a particular thing right investment demand or mm-hmm. export demand right but of course or consumer demand nothing's ex- almost nothing is exogenous so you really have to you'd think it'd be important to say well but why why did it decrease so it's not just the structural issue of which kind of demand might matter, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. but the underlying causation would seem to matter too. But but you got to start somewhere. Well, stuff happens. <laughs> stuff happens. Right. But, <laughs> I mean, you can't. I mean, look, you're gonna. If you say, if if you still, if you want to, if you want to, you want to start with, with a, a model in which the premise is that it's a deterministic world and and everything is already known. Then nothing can happen except random disturbances. I'm making, uh, I'm now making... you can get a certain distance with that. I myself have played around with that. I, I'm not criticizing anybody, uh, but um, I'm actually making a different argument. I'm saying since we, as the outside observers, don't know why, we don't have perfect knowledge. We don't know why um, demand fell. It's really hard to do comparative statics to say, you know, what are we holding constant when we when we do these thought experiments or these empirical experiments, right? It's very hard to know because something must have changed. It could just be random, but it probably isn't. It's probably something we didn't observe or don't understand that changed this. And as a result, our ability to predict it is, seems to be very limited. Are, are, are you saying that when something like, say, investment demand changes – we better know why it changed because otherwise our analysis is incomplete. Yeah, that's yes. I, I uh, oh, that's a constant. That's <laughs> that's uh, that's something that's hanging over um, so much of what we do. That means that there's just always one more step in the argument that we leave out. Yeah. So, yeah, so well, I you know, to, one thing at a time. But I wanted to ask a methodological question, especially for. Uh, non-academic listeners out there who are thinking, well, yeah. you know, these are all interesting models, and you know, you said I, you know, I, t- I put this in my model, or Friedman put this in his model, or he left this out. Mm-hmm. What do you think our ability is to distinguish between good models and bad models, and how w- how should we do that as economists? Uh, what I never saw a model I didn't like. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe in good models and bad models. I, 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 I carry around, as long as I can, so far I'm doing okay, I carry a, around a, in my head a tremendous repertory of models, Austrian, uh, Keynesian, Marshallian, Lucas, Sargent, Prescott, six or seven different kinds of models of my own, which I sometimes get tangled up. <laughs> That's the worst. It's most difficult to remember my own models. Um, <clears throat> and um, so, I mean, I... You know, if you do... If, if you study the price of peas and the output of peas, you might be able to get through your entire career with just the Marshallian model. I mean, you you can't get anywhere in macroeconomics with just one model. It just doesn't work. So my next question is: Do we make any progress? Um, oh, sure, because we've got we've got a, a vast increase in uh, the richness of our models now. I mean, the, the we 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 have new riches in the form of new models that we didn't have before, didn't conceive of before. Uh, my God, I mean, I have been witness to. Uh, um, well, I feel I was almost a witness to the uh, the. Um, after I was I was a student in uh, of economics in uh, the autumn of 1952. Um, only um, only. Uh, 16 years after the general theory came out. And I, I could go to the college library and read the debates between Keynes and Hayek, which was only 20 years ago, twenty years earlier. 
25, 20, 25 years, uh, 20 years earlier. So, I mean, I, I, I was sort of witness to, to that, and then I was a witness to the uh, American Keynesianism, which, which differed profoundly from Keynes because the Americans took the uncertainty out. <clears throat> they that took the convenient. lack of knowledge out of Keynes. <laughs> that was convenient. Yeah, yeah convenient. <laughs> <laughs> it's easier. It, the, the, math, <clears throat> the math went a lot easier. Yeah. Or at least, no, the, the math was more beautiful. Yeah. There wasn't that much math. It, 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 if you math. just took Keynes' marginal efficiency of capital, which was a subjective thing, and plopped it down, then it made, made it made it very obvious that there was something curious there. <laughs> so the Americans didn't like that, so they, they got rid of it. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> and then I saw the arrival of uh, Phillips, and then I participated in the... Uh, in the uh, debate about the Phillips curve and the, the, the whole debate about uh, the, the permanence of the effects of a shift in aggregate demand. And then I participated in the, uh, the, the then, I, that I, then I built my structuralist models in which the natural unemployment rate is constantly moving around. And uh, and now we're having a revival of uh, Austrian style models in which we uh, are forced, with, with thanks to the financial crisis, so we know that we're forced to, to understand that uh, not everybody, uh, uh, not only do we all have um, imperfect knowledge, but we also have um, disagreements. Uh, some people were bullish, some people were bearish, some people made money in the crisis, not very many. A lot of people lost a lot of money. You wonder why. I mean, so it, it, it just—it's been a—it's been a macroeconomics has been a roller coaster of uh, of uh, <clears throat> of um, discovery and uh, reappraisal and fights. Well, that's my question. That's why when I was uh, when I was in grad school in the seventies, mm-hmm. um, we were. We were taught late 70s, 76 to 80 mm-hmm. at Chicago. Mm-hmm. So it, it, there was a definite perspective there. Nobody there took Keynes seriously. Mm-hmm. The emphasis was on real business cycles and what stochastic shocks mm-hmm. or real shocks were, were causing un- mm-hmm. the business cycle. And that viewpoint, and of course, there was a focus on rational expectations, mm-hmm. which was... Focus is an under, under, underestimate. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> it was the hot topic. Yeah. And then understatement. Yeah. So that that kind of got um there were some problems that developed in, in, in those models or people weren't so happy with all of the results. But they looked kind of interesting and, and, and potentially and promising. And then all of a sudden then we had the so called great moderation, where a lot of very smart people said that we had mastered the business cycle. Yeah. And now it seems you could argue, I'm not going to push it quite this far, but you know, we're kind of back to square one. Not only did I not learn any Keynes at Chicago, I didn't learn any any Austrian theory. That was mm-hmm. that was dead in the minds of my professors right. 50 years or more, 40 years or more. Mm-hmm. Nobody took that stuff seriously. And now all of a sudden it's it's back. I don't know if it's back at the graduate school level at most places. I think it's mm-hmm. probably not, but it could start to be of interest. So it just seems that it seems more like a roller coaster than a Mm-hmm. As you say, than a slow, steady accumulation of knowledge. So I'm, I'm a little more pessimistic. Well, Make me feel better. Um, and Keynes is back too, by no, the way. No, I, I, Keynes I, is I, back, I, right? He's invoked no, by no, smart people. No, no, no. We, we, you don't go back to exactly the same place. You know, the Chinese. <laughs> I was saying, a man never crosses the river at this in the same way twice. Yeah. Um, I mean, we don't, we don't, I don't want to go back. We don't. We could never. You could never go back to uh, to the Keynes of 1936. We know too much. Uh, we would be second guessing almost everything he did there. But on the other hand, uh, it's an extraordinary book by an extraordinary mind, and it was extraordinarily influential for some pretty good reasons. And uh, not not to, to forbid it, almost like. Um, Hmm. Uh, like uh, Lady Chatterley's Lover or something like that. Or the work of the it's, devil. <laughs> it's really pretty ridiculous and, and atrocious, actually. Um, <clears throat> but, um, so I know I, 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 I... 
rational expectations is without doubt a casualty of the... Uh, we, we knew it was no good. I, Roman Friedman and I did a, a conference in 1981 called um, Individual Expectations and Aggregate Outcomes with a subtitle, Rational Expectations Reexamined. We went through models in which people have disagreements or even... Maybe they agree, but they think that they disagree, that they disagree. And, and uh, uh, I was fond of one of those, the, the latter. And, and um, just because it's mathematically more tractable. tractable. But um, <clears throat> so we had challenges to rational expectations. Just as, uh, by the way, Oscar Morgenstern and a few others challenged uh, the work on intertemporal equilibrium in the late 1920s by Hayek, which caused Hayek, by the way, to have a change of heart. <clears throat> um, Rare for any academic, yeah, any intellectual. <laughs> he didn't advertise it exactly, but... <laughs> so, um, where are we? Well, I'm, I'm asking... You know, I started this, this train of thought by asking how do you evaluate good models or bad models, and... Yeah. So here we have all these new choices. Um, a lot of things are back in play. You may say that the Keynes of 1936 is dead, but his insights still are relevant. And yet, to me, a lot of what I hear from public intellectuals who are called who are economists mm -hmm. is very 1936 Keynes. You know, we need to. Well, I think you're to, you're you're reading the wrong newspaper. <laughs> no, that could be. That could be. I hear you. Um, and I understand to. Keep reading between the I think lines. If you pick up the Financial Times, you'll see a much more diversity of opinion than you will, than you will in some family newspapers. I hear you. Um, but my only point, my real point, is that you know, no matter how sophisticated or or thoughtful we are, open minded, uh, which is hard because we all have many of us. I don't, but many I sort of do. Many of us have a horse in the race. It's hard to understand how we're we are to evaluate in what seems to be a unique each time crisis um and we don't have enough data points uh we have a great depression we have a great recession we have a lot of little recessions it's hard to know if our understanding of what causes the modern business cycle is getting any better or not i, I don't know i'd like to think it is but i don't see any evidence that we're better at well i think we'll, 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 we've we've rejected okay, some okay, things okay, okay um i'd like to pick up well i'm I, I won't repeat what I said before, that we have rising cumulative knowledge because at least some of us remember Hayek 1 and Hayek 2 and Keynes and the American Keynesians and uh, the Friedman Phelps perspective and the rational expectations revolution and the structuralist stuff and, and uh, the critique of rational expectations that Roman Friedman has done some of it uh, with with me. Uh, I remember all those things. So, I mean, I, I feel incredibly uh, richer. Um, probably others don't because, you know, I, I actually wonder whether some of the so-called Keynesians these days have actually read Keynes' general theory. I think they haven't. Otherwise, they wouldn't say some of the things they say. Hard anyway, to read. Uh, so I've, that's is that point, but the, but the other point <clears throat> is that, and now this comes profoundly back to uh, Hayek and imperfect knowledge, particularly of the future in this case, um, and Nietzschean uncertainty and all that. Uh, look, every. Every big crisis like that, like this, is um, not only out of the blue, they always are, they all are, but each one is in important ways quite different from the others. The world has changed quite a bit. Yep. We're not just going through... Um, something like the Great Depression of the 1930s, uh, where, where this, uh, this, uh, 
this slump is uh, different in important ways. Uh, on the other hand, it's probably the present slump is more different from uh, the garden variety recessions that we mostly had after World War II than it is different from the Great Depression of the 1930s. Yeah. I mean, now we're, we're, we're discovering all sorts of incredible stuff about the financial sector, which has evolved enormously in, in the space of two or three decades. So that's, that's something uh, different. And then we've got a globalized economy in which uh, the United States is producing maybe only a quarter of the output not something like almost half yep. in, in, the, in the decade or two after World War II. Um, there, and, 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 and there's so much more freedom of goods, freedom of capital. The, the rules of the game have changed so much. So everything, everything has to be rethought. And besides, you know, we never got consensus on the 1930s either. I know. I'm, I I think about that all the time. Yeah, so do I. <laughs> it just well, I mean that perspective, which you beautifully said, and I'm this sounds like a, a slam. It's not. It just a lot of what we talk about is ex post storytelling, which you know sounds like a horrible thing, but I think it's what we're best at. And there's nothing we're in search of knowledge, and as you say, there's a lot of things that are different now, so we can't just apply the models we had in the past. Okay. Uh yeah, I, 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 I hear you, but I, I, first of all, I think economists tell better stories than economic historians do. Economic mm -hmm. historians, well, they're great storytellers, but they don't understand economics as well as the economists do. So I think economists are, are able to tell better stories than, uh, the economic, than the historians that write for the general public with their very crude uh, stories. And, and we, we need stories to help help us to avoid making the same mistake twice, that sort of thing. Um, the other thing is, um, and now here I, I, I realize maybe I'll get an argument on this, but um, we need economists who are gifted with uh, a lot of insight and uh, uh, theoretical imagination to be involved in policy discussion. Um, we, if, if we don't have that component, we're, I think societies are going to be the poorer for it. Now, Britain had Keynes, and, and I think he would, he probably did more good than harm. Um, he wasn't always clear. Um, he had to change his mind sometimes, but that's okay. Um, but, but the intellectual caliber of his thought was, generally speaking, an awful lot better than what was being was coming from out from the from the was coming from the others, and um, I think we we have to. Um, uh, but unfortunately, I, I think these uh, a lot of these public intellectuals that you refer to are, are um, using slogans like. Keynesian economics, which is like a, a slogan for it's a slogan for can mean one thing one week and another thing another week. It can mean uh, a proactive stance towards social problems. It can, can mean nothing more than that, or it can mean uh, a big public sector is better than a small public sector. For some people, it means that. I mean, I think a lot of these public intellectuals are doing a lot of harm. To, to the quality of the discourse. Well, I, I like what you said about Keynes. I think it's it's ironic that pr 
probably his most important insight. He said he did a lot more harm than a lot more good than harm. It, but his, his most important insight, of course, wasn't listened to, which was the economic consequences of the peace. Yeah. If his insights into the impact of the Treaty of Versailles had been taken seriously, right, the world would be a lot different, a lot, uh, I think, a lot better. Um, well, we're almost out of time. I, I want to close with a, a real change of gears, if we could. Yeah. And I'd like you just to talk for a few minutes about your insights into what you call the good life. Right. And the workplace and um, what you think yeah. we understand about that. Because I think that's really yeah. deep and thoughtful. Well, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I have to have to resist the temptation that most of us feel to just pretend that I invented it, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty harmless. But, uh, actually, uh, <laughs> I don't have much time to read anymore, but, but I... But I, I, I like to ask myself once in a while what previous guys said and thought. And, and um, I was trying to put into my own words um, uh, some uh, thoughts I had about the good life in uh, a lecture I was giving in Munich. I think it was in 2003. And, um, and then by some accident, I had to sort of give another version of it very soon after, maybe it was uh, 12 months later, maybe, uh, in New York. And um, <clears throat> and um, I uh, realized at some point that I was uh, distilling uh, the thought of some philosophers that had happened to, to read in college. Uh, I didn't read Aristotle. I'd, I'd read uh, Plato, but um, so I had to scramble at some point to go back to Aristotle. But I, I, I had read uh, David Hume, who's so great on knowledge and how limited and tricky our knowledge is and, and the need for imagination. And, um, had a profound effect on me, and and then uh, I read Henri Bergson. I didn't realize that Bergson was, to some extent, um, doing a variation on uh, Nietzsche. I didn't read Nietzsche, but then also read William James, and uh, so Bergson and James in the late nineteenth century were. Uh, headline thinkers, and, and they, they had a lot to say about the importance of excitement and change and novelty and curiosity and adventure and, and, and how we change in the process of all that. And uh, then I, I remember that later, I remember that John Dewey was uh, sort of on that same wavelength. He was a uh, Columbia professor in the 20s and 30s, hugely important in his day. And um, he said that people, you know, would go to, go to work to make a boat. They got to have, um, got to have things to enlist their minds. And, uh, and um, so I, um, Now, why was I talking about this good life? Because I was I was trying to think of um, what I wanted. I, what, what my idea was the, the 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 idea in the background was that uh, my thought was that uh, this this uh, way of that this this conception of the good life could could maybe be the justification for uh, an entrepreneurial capitalism such as um, we thought in the year 2003 we had in the United States with still fresh memories of the Internet Revolution and all that. Now it looks like uh, uh, there's an awful lot less innovativeness and long-term innovative entrepreneurial spirit out there in the United States than we thought there was. But... 
In 2003, it, 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 um, I, I, I thought that um, it was important to, to, to celebrate this, the excitement, the engagement, the adventure that, that this system offered. And I thought this was a new way of defending capitalism. Previous theorists had thought that, well, capitalism is um, a good way for, um, it's a good system for, uh, for capital formation, for building up the capital stock. It's a good system for wealth accumulation. And it's nice to get rich. Well, it is nice to get rich, but, you know, uh, there are countries in Europe that, 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 um, don't have any of the innovativeness, the flair, and the excitement, and the, the spirit of uh, American capitalism, at least classic American capitalism. And they've got awfully high levels of wealth. Yep. They're very comfortable. They wear very fine suits. They have two or three homes, a boat, et cetera. They're fine. So you, you can't say that... Uh, that uh, you got to have capitalism these days to to be uh, to be rich and comfortable. So so that was that was um, what it's um, what it was all about. And I, and what's your uh, what's your thought now? I mean, I'm I'm still optimistic about that entrepreneurial spirit. Yes. So now I'm in the position of saying, look, I think we've lost some of it, but we can get it back, and we better get it back. And the reason we better get it back is because we want the good life. We want this good life that, that I was talking about. Also, there's a, there's a further point that if you have a, um, an economy with a lot of dynamism, meaning that, um, sure, opportunities come and go, but if you're equipped for innovation, you're, you're better off, obviously. Uh, you you want to be equipped to, to innovate when ideas strike. You you want to have this inbuilt dynamism uh, for another reason, and that is that uh, it, it's good for employment. Um, it, and high employment is good. You want people out that out there taking care of themselves, earning their own way in life, not being a burden on the on the public uh, uh, trough. Uh, you, you you want you want children to grow up with with parents who are who are role models of people who have careers and who enjoy the personal development so their personal development their intellectual growth so it seems to me just in a hundred different ways society is healthier if 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 employment is higher particularly if if it's high employment. In an economy that that, that possesses dynamism, that that, that offers uh, uh, challenging, engaging jobs. You so say you want, so you want, the, so so it's all intertwined. You, you you want the kind of economy that has the quality I'm talking about. If you have an economy of that quality, though, you also get some side benefits like high employment. A lot of people are drawn into it, and. Um, and then that brings some social benefits. Well, I don't – just a closing comment for me and let me get your reaction and then we'll, we'll uh, stop. But I, there's never been a, a society I don't think in human history like the United States today, even today, even with unemployment where it is and the economy being, being more abundant for you know two years. There's never been a time where creative people could use their creativity in – extraordinarily exuberant and satisfying ways. And I've, what, what I – so I have no – I think that's true, and I think we have an incredible environment for that kind of psychologically satisfying human experience. But I, I worry about whether that's just easy for me to say because I'm enjoying that. You know, I'm doing this podcast, and I get to do creative things in my job, but it's – it's a bigger proportion doing things like that than, than I say in any society in human history. The number of people who are 
self-employed doing things they love is really extraordinarily high. Um, and and the number of people doing creative things from the, the healthcare sector to the to the iPad to the it's just an amazing time. And yet and yet it's still only a small portion of the entire workforce. There's still I mean, I'm very lucky. I love going to work every day. Mm-hmm. But I wonder how many of us, you know, it's easy for us maybe to romanticize yeah, sure. that. Well of course I I I worried about that almost from the beginning of um my writings about this. Um, um <clears throat> I don't want to look naive in, in, in uh, not realizing that some jobs are uh, dirty and grimy and mindless and unrewarding, and they, and people take them some of those jobs only because of the money. And um, so, so I, I I do recognize that, and. Um, but at the same time, uh, uh, I reject. So I don't reject what you just said, but I do reject the idea that um, almost across the board, except for this hard core of imaginative, creative, talented people, that almost across the board, jobs are dreary. I, I was on um, a radio um, debate one day with uh, on NPR, and um, I thought I was by myself. I was carrying on about, about work and the importance of challenge and discovery and all that. And, and then after a commercial break, um, another guest came on. It was Robert Reich, the uh, former... Uh, Secretary of Labor in the Clinton administration. He couldn't have been kinder to me personally. But then he came, then he said, gee, most people in the United States hate their jobs. I was staggered by this and, and uh, very annoyed. And, and um, attacked him probably more harshly than I should have done. But... Um, that's not, what he said is not borne out by the data. If you look at data on job satisfaction and, and, and you look at people's responses to whether they're, they are really quite satisfied with their, their jobs or, or uh, fairly satisfied, by far, in the United States, by far the majority are highly satisfied or fairly satisfied. I think... People love being in the thick of things, love being involved in a company that is challenged, that is or trying to do things, that is aspirational, that is trying to achieve new things or meet new goals. That's part of life. People, people want to have that stimulus, want to have that challenge, want to have that involvement. And um, sure... Not everybody gets to um, invent um, the iPod or something like that. We can't all be Steve Jobs. But um, some of it rubs off. It's a kind of a trickle-down thing. Uh, as somebody said to me once, in a highly entrepreneurial, highly venturesome uh, society, even the waitresses and the waiters um, show more hustle and are more interested in performing well and more more involved in that job and doing it well because that's the, that's the culture it becomes the culture and I think that that, um, that culture is important to retain and promote and uh, celebrate. My guest today has been Edmund Phelps. Professor Phelps, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you. Enjoyed it. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. 
The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.